And now, um, as a journalism librarian, I want to share some media literacy tips and resources that can help all of us as we try to navigate the often overwhelming amount of news that is coming out about the war. Uh, as we all know, misinformation can run rampant during breaking news events because information is changing rapidly and it can be difficult to determine which claims are the most recent and which sources are the most credible, especially with content that evokes such strong emotional reaction. So what can be done? Um, first and foremost, it's important to analyze what kind of information you're viewing and be cautious about what you share. Who created the information you're consuming and what is their purpose for creating that information? That's key. <laughs> Um, are you reading actual news reports or someone else's interpretation of the news? Since the conflict began, misleading content such as video game footage and, and prior footage of prior conflicts are being passed off as war videos and attracting millions of views on social media. The second thing you can do is read beyond the headlines. Headlines are often designed to capture your attention and elicit emotion but many people will stop there without reading the full article and miss out on the larger context. If a video, photograph, or post seems to confirm your exact beliefs and makes you feel immediately furious or hopeful, that's a sign. <laughs> Take a minute to digest the content and investigate the source before you have that knee-jerk reaction to share. Um, also, seek a variety of news sources. Um, and I'm, I'm guilty of doing this as well. It's easy for us to passively rely on the news sources that social media algorithms want to show us. But I would also recommend um, seeking out um, a variety of credible news sources. Just like it's important to have a diverse uh, nutritional diet, it's important to have a diverse uh, news diet. Um, so, for example, the other night I was watching um, PBS NewsHour, and then I was also toggling back and forth between, um, I think it was ABC or CBS News, and I noticed that they were kind of filling in gaps, where one didn't dive in very deep, the other one did, and I was able to get a fuller picture of what was happening by digesting multiple news sources. But a lot of us don't do that, we stick to our go-tos, and we stick to what we're comfortable with, and then we find ourselves in an eco chamber. Um, and as U.S. affiliates, you have access to so much news, it's not even funny. So I'm sure many of you know that we have an institutional subscription to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and you can sign up to the full web platform. And it's not just enough to access your subscription. I've had students tell me, oh yeah, I signed up for that. I don't ever look at it. So to prevent yourself from falling into that trap, Try to sign up for the email newsletters. I get a New York Times email every morning with today's headlines. It gives me a good foundation to build off of. And then I do that with a variety of news sources. Um, and when you're trying to determine which news sources are more credible than others, um, look for sources that are, have great reputations for following high journalistic standards. We know no news source is perfect. Even the New York Times can make a mistake or have a crappy article. <laughs> but um, certain news sources have higher standards than others, and that's why it's important to follow a variety of them. Um, also, in addition to the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, you have access to, through the UF libraries to news databases where you can get behind paywalls for literally thousands of publications. Um, access to world news from Newsbank um, gets you access to 10,000 news publications from all over the world. So if you also want to bring in some international news sources, some wire services into your news diet, um, being a UF affiliate makes it really easy to do that. You don't have to pay for anything. I had a student tell me just yesterday, every time she hits a paywall, she just moves on and doesn't digest that news. You don't have to move on. We pay lots of money <laughs> for you to have access to these resources. Um, and then I also want to remind you to follow fact checkers. Um, fact checkers aren't perfect either, but sometimes they can add in additional context and do a deeper dive than we're able to do in our daily lives. So for example, I get daily emails from PolitiFact. Um, I also follow something from the News Literacy Project called Get Smart About News, where they dive into sort of media literacy issues, 
or um, propaganda that's being shared on the open web. Um, I get that uh, weekly newsletter as well, so I'm able to stay on top of, okay, what's being misconstrued out there? What do I have to, to keep on top of? Um, and then I wouldn't be a very good librarian if I didn't mention books and academic articles. So again, through the UF Libraries, if you just throw some keywords into our Primo search tool on the UF um, Library homepage, you can find books and ebooks. Um, we have books about the history of the Israel-Palestine conflict. We have, ish we have uh, books and ebooks about the ethics of war, how war is framed in the media, and the impact that has. So if you really want to get a bigger, fuller picture, we have lots of information resources for you to do that. Um, we also have a database called Opposing Viewpoints and CQ Researcher, where they take um, timely um, issues like this that we all care about and curate a variety of resources from a variety of sources in one place for you to easily digest and get some more context. Um, so there's really no excuse not to be better informed and to um, be on top of misinformation. Um, so those, I could go on forever, but I'll stop there. <laughs> those were my, my tips. Um, so now um, we can move on to the Q&A. Um, so the way that we're going to do this is questions will be submitted on index cards, um, and our interns will pick those up and take them to me, and I will select and read them to our panelists. Um, once you have your questions on your index cards, you can just hold them in the air, and, uh, or if you need an index card, just raise your hand or a utensil, um, and our interns will um, be happy to help you with that. Um, we will now be taking comments directly from the floor. We know this is going to feel limiting, but we are being abundantly cautious to keep the conversation civil, respectful, and constructive. We really want to get this right and make sure the event is as successful as it can be. Um, so far, so good. <laughs> uh, if anyone um, speaks from the floor or is otherwise disruptive, we'll ask you to stop. If you don't stop, um, we'll ask you to leave. Hopefully, it won't come back. So, I will await your questions. If anybody wants to talk to me about research and resources afterwards, I can nerd out on it all day with you. Why do I like it? Can you say how we find these opposing viewpoints? I, I didn't hear about it, and I think that's an amazing piece of so maybe why people are writing it and explain yeah. how to do it. If you click on uh, databases on the main library homepage and then click on the A through Z databases list, you can just type in opposing viewpoints. Um, another similar resource is called CQ Researcher. Uh, which also gives you, um, you know, pro-con um, statements and uh, chronology, editorials, and all kinds of fun stuff. Cool, thank you. Okay, I think this is an interesting question, so I'll start with this one. When war is not justified, what are the next steps to seizing this war, whether they are steps taken by a community, a country, or the United Nations? Great question. Yeah. <laughs> stop. Oh, um, that's a great question, and um, it's not one that ethicists, um, philosophers think about too much. Um, it's a question of power and accountability, right? Who actually has the power? And this is a big problem of just war theory, um, or any kind of ethical framework, is who has the power to enforce it. Um, and in the case of um, uh, international conflict, um, you know, there's the, the global community, right? Which means powerful nations, the United Nations, NATO, etc. Um, and um, the, the problem is they're, I mean, not to sound too cynical, but they tend to be very self-interested. And so does anyone operate according to, you know, impartial ethical principles um, on a global stage? Not particularly. Um, I think that's pretty rare. Uh, we see it sometimes after the fact, for example, in like the Nuremberg trials, right? There's accountability, but while the conflict is going on, I think it's it's really hard um, to change that course. Um, there are things, of course, like political sanctions, um, etc. Um, I don't know if, if you guys have thoughts about that. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I'm just and the I think that's part of the tragedy of this type of conflict is that you know how it starts and it starts honestly, and then no one is sure how it's going to end, which is why I kind of ended with saying 
we don't know what's going to happen, and more than that, the aftermath there, what one poet called Sunday after the war, is really where the rebuilding starts taking place, and this is going to happen. And of course, the rebuilding, not just in the physical sense, but also in the communal sense, also in the sense of creating bonds again. So yeah, I think when, how to stop a war and when to stop a war are like very important, very difficult questions. Uh, well, by, of course, from one perspective, some wars have, in many cases, official war objectives, but they are also often not fulfilled, or they extend, or they change, so you never know what kind of the boundaries are. It's a very fluid situation, which I guess is what's so frustrating for us, right? Because we want kind of a clear cut answer of which which does not. I'm not sure I have too much to add, but um, there is theory and practice, and fortunately, practice is not always or very seldom in conjunction with, with theory. So I'm thinking about the Balkan War in the 1990s in Europe. Uh, where uh, international bodies really dragged their feet to get involved, even though there were uh, proven horrible massacres towards civilians. So you have the national bodies like the UN, you have NATO in, in Europe, um, but often, like Anna said, it's, it's self-interest determines whether um, the international mechanisms actually take place, and unfortunately, most of the time, um, there are not adequate intervention to uh, accompany what it should have been happening. Okay. Um, next question. When seeking out opposing viewpoints, where should the line be drawn? How far should one be willing to go in understanding potentially bigoted views before ending the discussion? I believe that's a lesson you have in problems. <laughs> say that when you're seeking out opposing viewpoints, um, and I think this person is, is not talking about media sources or information sources, but people, other people. And for me, like, it's annoying where your boundaries are. And when I have discussions with people, I know there's a certain line where if someone says this, then I'm ending the conversation, <laughs> you know? And I think um, you all probably have similar boundaries. If something to me is just straight out um, xenophobic, racist, um, homophobic, any of those things, when I feel like it's getting into, into that territory, then I'm done with the conversation. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's a great answer. I mean, basically, once you feel a personal boundary, which I guess is what I was trying to get to with the question of the existential core identity, once you feel unsafe, basically, or kind of a viewpoint, which doesn't mean uh, we should use it, of course, as a, as a cop-out to uh, not experience it, not going out of our comfort zone. That's kind of a very delicate balance. What I do is I try, I find it's mu it much harder, but much rewarding to talk to people in person. I know it's really me. Because I get a walk, or because I know them personally, because they are family members, uh, and because that's, that's where we remember that the, this person poses an opposing view, but they are also a human being, they are human being that we care about, because I don't want to spend time talking about that. Um, Thank you. Um, thanks for the Throughout the conflict, many people have said things such as, the killing of all human beings is bad and we must condemn the murder of civilians. While most people have agreed with this statement, it hasn't had an effect on politicians slash world leaders. How can we go beyond this rhetoric to make actual progress towards a ceasefire? I mean, this goes a little bit to the practice and theory um, question that we, that we just talked about, um, the ineffectiveness of ethical theories to actually make change in the world. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think it's pretty useless to say, you know, all of something is bad. Um, the point of just war theory 
you know, if you buy it, which, you know, I have a lot of questions like any about just war theory, but it is the accepted framework, the dominant framework for thinking about the ethics of war in, um, you know, many, many traditions. Um, and it suggests that sometimes war is justified if we want to reject. So, so the question said two things. One is killing people is always wrong. The other is killing civilians is always wrong. Killing civilians is always wrong is compatible with just war theory. Um, killing people all, if any killing is wrong, then that becomes a pacifist stance, which is also you know worth, worth talking about. Um, maybe war is just so destructive um, that it doesn't achieve the goals that just war theorists think it's going to. Um, I would I would just say in terms of you know what do we want to do if we can help? Um, you know, I always go. To, my default is solidarity with the victims. There's so many victims. There are. Um, ways to provide solidarity and, and aid to people who are suffering now seems to me to be an immediate thing. Um, and then, um, sadly, we seem to kind of learn in retrospect. There have been a lot of peace and reconciliation commissions in the wake of political conflicts in different parts of the world. Some things have been learned, um, but we, then we seem to sort of start over again. <coughs> I think it's also important to think about just for theory as a theory, as something that is constantly evolving and how it has been shaped by realities on the battlefield to a large extent. And uh, with biological weapons, with nuclear, potential nuclear warfare, it's constantly changing. And I think what Janine was talking about here, as this being a paradigm shift, is important because it's so complex. Um, and and I and I not not be surprised that uh, this ongoing conflict will also be a contributing factor to how we think about just war uh, moving forward. So nothing of this is written in stone. We have what we want to strive to. We have the practice realities of things, and we have weaponry constantly changing, we have enemy pictures constantly changing, and all this is affecting how we think of it. But the important thing is to think about it, to be critically aware that there are some ethical standards we need to try as much as possible to uphold uh, and keep humanity in center. If we don't think about things, if we don't be critical, um, try to be critical towards what's going on, we kind of give it up. What kind of moral responsibility do we have to each other on social media? I'll start with that because I have a very short answer. Don't use social media. <laughs> I mean, I know it's a bit extreme. I find, uh, I guess to April's point, don't consume your news on social media, for the very least, because that's an algorithm that is meant to monetize on you and to produce the content that will just reinforce your opinions. So go to the opposite of the anti-social media. I would also say social media has very dire effects on mental health, and we could all use a boost in our mental health nowadays. So consider very well which types of social media you use, and for what purpose. If you want to reconnect with, with loved ones, that's one story. If you are using it as your main news source, I would urge you to reconsider. Yeah, I, I would just second that. Maybe cat videos, um, puppies. Uh, other than that, um, yeah. Shout out to social media. Sure. Yeah, cat videos is a good thing. Um, dog videos, I prefer. But I think it would be good to, before you post something against someone, Imagine that person standing in front of you. Imagine that you, this is a person you speak to, and then think, would I have said the same thing if that person was in front of me? Yeah, and I'll add to this if I can. Um, I would just add that I think our responsibility is to make sure anything that you share in social media, you take the time to read, digest, confirm, um, has this been reported by any other credible news sources, like do some lateral reading. And an, an anecdote I can give you is one time my mom shared an article that was really offensive on social media, and I came back to her and I said, Mom, what, do you really believe this? And she was like, no. Oh, is that what the article was about? And she just, again, had a major reaction to a headline, 
was like, yeah, that's right, and wanted to share it, and then didn't really digest the article. And uh, I know everyone thinks that everyone else does that, but we don't do that, but I think we probably all have done that at some point. All right, our next question is, uh, well, I'll come back to that, because that's a question for me. <laughs> um, How do we separate the Israel-Palestine conflict from Jews around the world who are being attacked right now? How do we stop allowing anti-Semitism to rise, as well as Islamophobia? Why do we allow and promote hate around the world? Why do we allow us to hate around the world? Why do we allow and promote hate around the world? That's a question. Yeah, if you would have known that, that would have been great, right? How to stop promoting hate. Uh, we have seen significant increase in number of anti-Semitic incidents and Islamophobic incidents over, I think it was five to eight times since October 7, so five four to eight four, even worse as far as statistics go, as far as people can analyze in social media. And so both actual incidents of anti-Semitism, but also just uh, anti-Semitic comments, microaggressions, and so on, and the same goes for Islamophobia, although I don't have the data on that, but we know there is a significant increase. So, again, one way of, uh, there are a couple of ways of combating it. One way of combating it is the zero tolerance uh, that you were mentioning earlier, like, this is where I draw the line. Uh, I draw the line with Islamophobia. I draw the line on Islamism, right? Yeah. That's a pretty easy line to draw. Uh, and the other is really to think about what is it that uh, what is it that is being promoted and where does it come from? And we have in fact many classes both in religion and in Jewish studies that deal precisely with these topics of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. They're, uh, the, the origins of this type of extreme hatred and how to think about it. So there's no kind of easy answer, unfortunately, and there is a, it is something we see, so we shouldn't ignore, we shouldn't ignore it or wash it under the rug. Okay. Outside of America, there are dozens of countries and an unconscionable amount of people that see this war, or uncountable, <laughs> amount of people that see this war as one about religion. How do we continue the conversation, attempt to find common ground, when one's viewpoint is based in religion and unchanging? Say that last part again. Um, how do we continue the conversation, um, slash attempt to find common ground when one's viewpoint is based in religion and unchanging. Terry, you want to start? As the chair of religion. <laughs> the chair of religion department. Here, here. <laughs> Lost the words. Well, I'm teaching a course called Religion and Violence, and I think one of the takeaway points is that nothing is only about one thing or the other. Religion may be part of it, and I think religion is clearly part of, of this conflict uh, from to various degrees, but it's not only. Um, and I think what we need to do is think with one more than one thought in our head of what is this all about, uh, and decipher. Try as much as possible to decipher what they, where things belong, uh, and sometimes it's simply impossible to do so because for many religious identity as a communal identity, as a national identity, as an ethnic identity, in the way that we uh, contains many things at the same time and the other then also contains many things on the other side and the other at the same time. So an Israeli becomes a Jew, becomes whatever, Palestinian becomes a Muslim and so on. And then we sometimes exaggerate one or the other and make it into something it doesn't necessarily have to be. So it's about, you know, being informed and trying to decipher the different aspect of a given conflict. Um, 
Yeah, I would just add that another takeaway from thinking about religion and violence is that there's no religion that's essentially peaceful or essentially violent. They all have the capacity because they're human constructions, right? So just like every culture, every society has the capacity to be violent or peaceful, so do all religions. So it's really important to not to essentialize, you know, Buddhism is peaceful, Christianity is violent, or, or whatever stereotypes um, people have, and to look at the complexity as very said. Yeah, the students in the senior seminar on religion at this point kind of it's almost a joke that we first need to define religion before we can actually say something about religion and do it throughout time and again. I think it's I, I think it's it's very true. We first need to think about okay, on the one hand religion has power in everything and the importance of religion is increasing, which is why which is why we enjoy studying religion, which is why we think the study, academic study of religion is very important. At the same time, we shouldn't attribute everything to religion. This question is for Yaniv. Can you further discuss these comparisons? Um, and I think this is part of that. We have these long talks and discuss this back and forth. Do you think there is any sense of point or is it just human nature? I am not sure I understand the question. Well... Uh, uh, I invite... Uh, I'm sorry, I really want to answer it, but I don't quite understand it, so I invite whoever has to come afterwards and I'll be able to talk to them. Does that make yeah. sense? That's not good. I'll put that one aside for now. Do we have a responsibility to encourage discourse among friends, even if it is likely to devolve into an unproductive conversation with people upset with each other, given the people's backgrounds and temperaments? The problem is Google had destroyed any good conversation. Just Google it and you had the answer. I think fighting and disagreement, not fighting, but disagreement is healthy. Uh, I think that if you have a particular viewpoint, you should be um, able to defend your viewpoints with uh, good arguments, with facts, with data, and so on. Uh, but it also boils down to how do we treat each other with respect. Um, that you should be allowed within certain limits to have your different opinions. But if you do have a very outrageous opinion, you should be able to argue for it in a sensible manner uh, that makes sense to, to everyone. I think the, the point you made about the reason is very important because the conflict is Likely so, is a, it raises very affecting, very emotional response, and rightly so. But we should also you know, take a deep breath and try to think about the reasons and arguments, and that's what we've been trying to model here throughout the conversation. I would say yes, so in short, the answer is yes, try to find a friend, a friend and Know that this is not the only thing that defines who you are or who they are. Right? It sounds a bit obvious, but you might share interest in many other things and you might disagree on that. And if you remember that you have this basic appreciation and respect for one another, then you can actually have honest conversations. Uh, I work in the times at major military powers. Um, U.S., China, Russia, France, U.K., will never really act to end civilian targeting in this conflict because they also have targeted civilians in the past, and acting against it now would highlight their hypocrisy. Do you think this issue is a barrier to ending civilian targeting in the current war, and if so, how do we overcome it? Yeah, this is just the geopolitics of war, um, and I'm not an expert in that, but um, coming, you know, coming at it as an ethicist, um, it's very rare for even individuals to really live according to their principles, and then you ask a nation to do that, um, and they have um, self-interest, perceived self-interest, which is never the self-interest of the entire community, it's always the self-interest of a small group within that community, and I direct you all to read Reinhold Niebuhr's masterpiece, Moral Man and Immoral Society, and for more on that. 
Um, and, um, you know, Zebra talks about the war, and he wrote this 1931 after World War I, you know, and saw clearly there war and calls to patriotism, etc., are usually in the interests of a small group within a society, right? And usually, you know, it, it, war makes money, you know, war is profitable for people, um, for some people, not for the, the cannon fodder. Um, and um, the point of the question of, um, you know, the U.S., et cetera, et cetera, um, target civilians, absolutely. And, and this goes back to the point I was just trying to make about just war theory, is that a lot of times people stop with, oh, I have a just cause, right? And we can see this in World War II, right? Which was, a, you know, if, if fighting against Hitler is a just cause, then you know, we don't have a just cause. Um, and that led a lot of people to argue that things like dropping atomic bombs on Japanese cities and firebombing Japanese cities was therefore justified because Hitler said, we need to do whatever um, we can to stop him. Um, and so that becomes a really hard conversation because then if you say, well, like, maybe we should rethink these strategies because they are deliberately targeting civilians, it's very hard to be a critical patriot. And I think that this is really hard for us as Americans right now. It's much, much harder for people in Israel and Palestine right now to be critical patriots who love their communities. And um, just to, we need to keep in mind as observers the distinction between the governments and the people in, in all these settings. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I hear a kind of, oh, both in this question and other questions, the kind of helplessness that we feel sitting here in this room and, and you know, being part of a world community that is unfair, that is suffering, and having politicians that we don't control or that we feel so far away from, and that, yeah, we can sit here and talk, what can we do? And it's true, I mean, I feel the same, you know, what. What different does it make, whatever I'm doing, what's mine to say, but boils down to if you don't do anything, it's only get worse. And then you can say, well, we live in democracy, we're the one responsible for the leaders we have. It's not as simple, but at the same time it is simple. So I, I hear, you know, the frustration and the, the helplessness, and I, I share it in the way that, you know, you feel so you can't do anything. But it's about being an informed citizen. It's about, you know, making the effort that we can to, to make this a better world where we, we are, where we are. It's not a good answer, but it's all I have. So I'm going to be a bit more optimistic because, okay, for a change, because you can do quite a lot, right? You can organize on the local level. You can be more informed by coming to this type of event, right? We talked about talking to people. You can do that. You can do the most American thing I've ever heard, which is call your senator or congressman, right? It sounds funny, but you know, if they get enough calls, this can actually have an impact. So you do have power, it's true. Not, none of us individually has power to affect the course of historical events in this sense, but we do have our local community power, which we definitely utilize. All right, I'll make you guys some questions until you guys tell me to stop. <laughs> um, you said that, that selective outrage is expressed slash shaped as a reflection of who we are. How do you think our U.S. versions of oppression, of genocide, of accountability, uh, lack thereof, is impacting the ways we are responding to this war? How do you think our U.S. versions of oppression, of genocide, of accountability, slash lack thereof, is impacting the ways we are responding to this war? It definitely is, and, and without going into too much detail of American politics, there is a history of uh, who are our allies um, in this conflict, and that's the same for all the sides that the U.S. is taking in certain conflicts. Um, there is 
a racial history, there is um, a political history that has shaped and still shaped who we find to be our friends and who we find to be our enemies. And our media is constantly confirming that, shaping that. Um, uh, when I mean racially, people who look like me, we feel more uh, concerned about what's going on in Ukraine than what's going on in Sudan, as a matter of fact. And the media is constantly uh, shaping that by feeding us selective uh, information about different kinds of conflicts. I mentioned that the Ethiopian civil war has, has you know, killed more than 600,000 in the last few years. Who of you knew that? It's the largest war in, in, in recent history. It's larger than the Ukraine, Yemeni, and so forth combined. Nobody was do that, right? Is it our moral responsibility to talk about the war? Are we morally responsible to spark conversations about the war, especially if the war doesn't affect us personally? That's a great question. I would say no, which I know might be a controversial position. Uh, I don't think uh, people who are not affected have a moral responsibility because, as I said, once we start expanding it, then we reach also. Do I also have the moral responsibility to talk about Ethiopia and about Sudan and about Yemen like, and about Ukraine? Like, where, where does it stop? But I will say we have a moral responsibility to do our best, and sometimes to do our best is talking. Some of us cannot avoid talking about it because we are affected emotionally, physically, in other ways. Uh, so for those of us who are affected, we, we need listeners, so we need people who are able to talk, but we also need people who are able and willing to listen. And, uh, but yes, I, I think if you don't feel any type of involvement, then, then sure, you don't have to take responsibility for everything. Yeah, we, don't, we can't take responsibility for everything. Although, I mean, the US is going to be spending billions and billions of dollars a day on this. So we are, in a sense, all, all affected, right? And we are all, you know, we're all tied together um, in this. Um, and I think talking about things, um, any issue um, is the first step to, it's certainly not the end, but it's the first step to beginning to solve things because if we don't talk about them, we won't, and this is true for things like climate change and institutionalized racism and all kinds of domestic issues and global issues, that, that talking is an important first step. And I agree with Andy, we cannot do everything, we can't be experts on everything, we can't take the burden of the world on ourselves, but, um, I guess I would say, you have a moral responsibility to get informed and talk about something. It doesn't have to be this, right? The question was whether we have a moral responsibility to talk about the war. Well, I think we do. If we think of war as something negative, if we think of war as something that should be avoided, yes, I think we have a moral responsibility not only to talk, but to make an effort to try to, to end of war doesn't mean that uh, any war is one side is right and the other side is wrong, but the draw of the casualties in war and casualties, I think we all agree, is something negative. So in that way, uh, it's a utopia to try to end all wars, but I think it should be a target, it should be a more responsibility to always talk about war as something unwanted. For the stakeholders in the Israel-Palestine conflict, these issues are so deeply ingrained in people's identities. In theory, it's easy to suggest seeking sources that don't confirm your bias. How can we encourage folks to see beyond the isms of their identities so we can engender empathy for all victims of this war? Great question. Great question. I would say one way of doing it is, is starting small, meaning uh, 
try to find someone you do identify with, but it holds a different opinion. And this is, you know, again, it's not it's not a screen, it's a marathon, right? It, it's very steps. And this already will hopefully take one out of their comfort zone and it will force them to rethink some of their position. So if you are if you are a Republican, try talking to a moderate Republican, right? If you are a hardliner Republican, or try to, if you are a hardliner on the left, try talking to moderate Democrats, right? It sounds silly, but even there you will kind of find disagreement, you will, and it will force you to, that would be, oh wait, if I can't even agree with people say that you vote like me, what's going on further, and this would allow you, hopefully, to explore, so I'll just say start small. I just want to pick up on one word that Annie used um, that we've heard several times, which is this idea of the comfort zone, um, and it reminds me of um, HB 999 and SB 266 that talk about how we're not supposed to say things and use terms um, that make certain people uncomfortable. Um, and um, I'll say this is being recorded, and I'm not supposed to, but um, we um, sometimes it's okay to make people uncomfortable, and I think that's what we do um, as scholars and teachers. Um, but there's a difference between making people uncomfortable and, and hate speech and ad hominem argu arguments and the things that we all agree are wrong, but to, to challenge in an informed and respectful way is an act of, of caring. That's, that's what we do as teachers. Um, and so sometimes, you know, if, if someone, for example, is a Holocaust denier, and I challenge them, and I say, you know, they say, oh, it's really uncomfortable when you, when you say that this happened, and I think it didn't, and I say, well, you know, maybe you should be uncomfortable, right? Maybe. Um, and so um, there's lots of other things that, um, you know, where we, so this whole idea of a comfort zone, it's important to keep in mind also um, the larger context of um, what higher education is for. Um, will we still be able to have events like this and have um, these good conversations um, even though they make many of us uncomfortable and, and on purpose, right? We're, we're trying to, to make to make ourselves uncomfortable a little bit so that we grow. Um, so I'll just say that. Many Americans are desensitized to violence in the Middle East and don't care to devote their time slash energy on caring about this war. How do we inform and make those aware without weighing one down with the constant negative news, um, something, videos, <laughs> and articles showing violence? I, I feel like this sort of repeats some of the points we've already had. Um, and again, that sense of hopelessness that Terrier responded. I think we kind of, I mean, I don't have anything new to add there yet. Um, we, um, yeah, you put it out, we may want to move soon to sort of an informal version of this and wind down, but um, are there any questions that are like, Topics we haven't really addressed. Well, there's, there was one that I was going to address, so I can get into that. <laughs> um, I don't know where to even start with researching this conflict. What are some good starting sources on the history and modern um, complications? So I think this is a really good question because even before I um, agreed to be a part of this panel, I thought, wow, I need to get a lot more informed about this. <laughs> So some of the things that I did is, again, turning to some of the great resources that we have access to um, as UF affiliates. So um, I looked at the Israel-Palestine conflict topic page on opposing viewpoints. Um, I also looked at some of the, um, the books on the historical um, buildup that we have in the UF libraries. We have some great ebooks you can read right on your device. Um, and also, many of you probably already know about this, but a, a tip that I like to use is if you want to research something kind of in a hurry, um, or uh, you, know, you have a lot of information to process in a short amount of time, I will usually put in my keywords into Google and then do site colon edu, 
and that's only going to bring you that content from educational websites. So you get a lot of press releases about academic studies, you get a lot of white papers, you get a lot of really easily digestible information from educational sources. Um, so I do, I do that a lot. There's also a resource called um, Journalist Resource, and it is a website where um, it's designed for journalists. You can learn a lot about a controversial issue in a short amount of time, but they curate a lot of academic studies and background research, and then they summarize it and synthesize it for you. So that can be a really great way to learn about a topic that you are like, I know nothing about this. Where do I even start? So those are just a few of my tips. Or you can find a friendly librarian to ask for help. So. Um, or you could take religion classes. Or, yes, um, that too. <laughs> we have lots of classes on Judaism, Islam, religion and politics, religion and violence, um, ethics, and um, we would be really happy to see some of you um, in our classes. You can learn about the historical philosophical background of some of these issues. Um, we have courses on religion and nationalism, religion and extremism, religion and violence. Um, Etc. Etc. Um, and also our website, um, the Ethics and Public Sphere website. We will um, maybe be, we'll try to put up some additional um, sources on that also. So okay, we're gonna break to like informal. So we'll still be around. Terry has to go to a dinner, but we'll still be around. Thank you, everyone. We were really nervous.